Hello, welcome to the lecture series of the Open University's MOOC course on Genocide. MOOC stands for Massive Online Open Courses and this method of study has already been applied successfully for several years around the world. Here at the Open University, we too decided to take up the challenge focusing on one of the fascinating topics learned at the Open University, the research of genocide and genocide studies, even in such a short series of lessons designed for the general educated audience. In this series of lessons, you will also be able to watch lectures for five weeks. The lecturers will deal with various case studies of genocide, which I will soon elaborate on. You can also take part in the activity in our course website, built especially for this MOOC, where you will find questions, interviews and forums, where you can participate, post your thoughts, suggestions for different cases, books, movies and other material you have seen, experienced and want to share with other students participating in this course. In short, I hope it will be interesting. Our five-week course framework starts with the first week, which is more like a theoretical overview of the field of genocide studies. In the five lectures you will watch this week, we will present the main subjects engaging the community of researchers who studied the issue of genocide during the last decades. Among others, this coming week will host Professor Yair Oron, who is actually the spiritual leader of the Open University's genocide course and hear him talk about his views and ideas and how he became a genocide researcher. Besides that, already in the first lecture, we will review some of the main characteristics of genocide studies in Israel and around the world. We'll also talk about one of the main arguments, one of the interesting issues in that area, the comparison between the Holocaust of European Jewry and other cases of genocide that occurred in the world during the past two centuries. Then we'll hold a theoretical discussion on how to identify threats of genocide in various places such as preconditions that commonly occur in cases of genocide which sadly we usually notice only retroactively. In addition, together we will review the UN Convention written and approved at the UN General Assembly in December 1948 in Paris where it then resided. The Convention is actually the core document regarding the overall issue of genocide. In the coming lecture, we will read this Convention together, analyze it, see its flaws and weaknesses, as well as its strengths that exist nevertheless. The main point we will notice on this matter is the sad truth that ever since this Convention was drafted in late 1948 and until today, it did not prevent a single case of genocide. It turned out to be quite ineffective, to say the least, when it comes to prevention of genocide. In the second part of the same UN Convention, the section about trying criminals who participated in genocide has some degree of effectiveness. We will elaborate on that later this week in the next lecture. In another lecture this week, we will conduct a general overview of cases of genocide that occurred during the last century, mainly. I'll give you a general overview of this subject while the theme of the next five weeks of the course is to build together some kind of model based on our experience, a comparative model between different cases of genocide through which we can try to test and explore whether there is any similarity between the different cases of genocide or each case stands on its own independently. The central theme of our discussion is the question of whether universal human nature causes acts of genocide regardless of the time or continent or culture it takes place in, or is this something that cannot be compared in any case? In our genocide course, which has been taught at the Open University for several years now, we're quite convinced that the different cases of genocide are comparable. Therefore, we will try to build some kind of model together. We will present the similarities and differences and try to show you how the similarities generally outweigh the differences in different cases of genocide. Before we start reviewing the content of our course and conclude this introductory lecture for the next five weeks of the MOOC course, I'd like to point out, point out something that I consider a critical issue, especially for a Hebrew-speaking audience or a Jewish audience around the world, most of which <coughs> lives in Israel, a country that one of its central guiding narratives for decades is the responsibility it took upon itself to represent of the memory of the Holocaust of European Jewry, the memory of the victims and the kind of assurance 
by the State of Israel that an event like the Holocaust will never occur again. Although this course focuses mainly on cases of genocide that occurred in other cultures at other times, regardless of the Holocaust of European Jewry, it will nevertheless influence our discussion in the next five weeks in various ways. Whether we like it or not, the Holocaust is undoubtedly the ultimate genocide case imaginable when it comes to genocide in the 20th century. There are several reasons for this. Firstly, the Holocaust was the most industrialized genocide ever in history. This might be needless to say, as most are quite familiar with the story of the Holocaust, but we are also aware that the Nazi killing machines industry of death during World War II is difficult to compare with other cases of genocide, where there weren't the same well-oiled bureaucratic mechanisms of manpower that was recruited and forced people to sign an oath of secrecy on the extermination of human beings as if they were animals like, led like lambs to the slaughter. There's really no comparison between the industrialized extermination machine of the Holocaust and other cases of genocide. In this context, each case of genocide has its atrocities. I'll give one example to illustrate how I don't mean the industrialization of death during the Nazi period necessarily made the Holocaust more or less traumatic than other events around the world. For example, the genocide in Rwanda that occurred in 1994 and, <clears throat> and lasted between May to June 1994 is considered the fastest in history. In this genocide, nearly 900,000 people were eliminated in three months, mainly by machetes, a kind of long knife used usually to clear paths through the jungle. Therefore, any case of genocide has its own horrific angle and specific traumatic point. But allow me to say a few more words about the Holocaust. For many years now, the academia around the world, surely in Israel, has been holding a fierce debate that's very difficult to rule on. It's divided into two major camps of researchers who have different views on how to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and how to compare the Holocaust to other genocides that occurred throughout history, if that's even possible. The camp advocating that the Holocaust is a unique event that shouldn't even be compared to other cases of genocide is still heard and is also very dominant in Israeli academia. However, it is far less dominant around the world these days. Standing against them is the other camp of researchers who claim not only that the Holocaust is comparable to other cases of genocide, but that it ought to be compared for reasons I will soon briefly list. Let's start with the positions of the first camp in order to understand this debate, which will allow us to keep the Holocaust in mind throughout our course during the next five weeks, as I mentioned before, while we elaborate on other cases of genocide. The first camp which advocates that the Holocaust should not be compared with other cases of genocide, as it is a unique historical event or even one that is above history to some extent, believes that if we compare the Holocaust to other cases of genocide in our research, we risk diminishing its historical memory. We run the risk of turning the Holocaust into a banal event, that is a banalization of the subject of the Holocaust. This camp maintains that the Holocaust of European Jewry was such a big and traumatic event, so different from anything else that happened in history, that it must be treated as something that stands alone and under no circumstances should be compared with other cases of genocide. I will illustrate this point with a somewhat amusing anecdote with your permission. Over 13 years ago, a famous conference was held in Durban, South Africa, the first co conference of its kind designed to discuss issues of racism and genocide. It was attended by many scholars, including Jewish scholars from around the world and Israel, alongside many other researchers from Asia, Europe, America and Africa. The main themes or debates at the Durban conference was almost amusing, at least for those who are not accustomed to this type of academic debate about the proper attitude towards the Holocaust of European Jewry. One of the main arguments was over the issue of whether to write the word Holocaust with a capital or lowercase h. The intention, I hope, is clear. Once we start a word in English with a capital letter, it becomes an independent noun that cannot be used for other purposes. Once we start the same word with a lowercase letter, it can then supposedly be used in other contexts too. 
If I may, I will translate this debate to some terms we might better relate to and are probably more familiar with in the context of news, television, internet, newspapers, which we've seen quite a lot of in recent years. We, at least in Israel, we've all heard about the Armenian genocide in recent years. It was hard not to hear or watch the media discussing this topic. Naturally, this issue is somewhat politicized because it is related to Israel's warming or cooling diplomatic ties with Turkey. Unfortunately, the relations with Turkey have worsened in recent years for various known reasons, and the rhetoric of both the Turkish president and other officials against Israel led Israeli politicians and intellectuals to react by speaking out against Turkey and bringing up the issue of the murder of the Armenian people, calling on the state of Israel to recognize the Armenian genocide. If you think about it for a moment, the word Holocaust is occasionally uttered in the context of the Armenian Genocide. I hear it very often. Serious intellectual people, not necessarily unedu uneducated, use the term Armenian Holocaust. This is precisely my point when I talk about the views of this camp, which believes we mustn't compare the Holocaust to other cases of genocide. Can the word Holocaust be used, especially by people who want to preserve the memory of the Holocaust and truly care about this issue? I definitely consider myself as part of the camp that wants to preserve the memory of the Holocaust. But can this concept, this noun, the Holocaust, be taken and applied to a genocide inflicted and on another people? Is it conceivable to call the Armenian genocide the Armenian Holocaust? I think not. I think the word Holocaust should remain the domain of traumatic Jewish memory only. But that's up for debate. It's a matter of opinion and perspective and certainly not a hermetically sealed and resolved issue. Some think it should be done while others believe it shouldn't. We have a pretty good term to describe what happened to the Armenians and what happened to a whole host of other nations. Genocide. That's the term. Genocide. We will analyze this term in detail in the next lecture of the course. Before we end this brief introduction, I'd like to say a few words on the notion held by the second camp of Holocaust and genocide scholars, both in Israel and abroad, who believe not only that the Holocaust is comparable to other cases of genocide, but that it ought to be. And I'm also about to explain the views of this camp which I belong to. This course you're going to take in the next few weeks is influenced by this attitude to some extent. I start from a slightly different angle to make things clear, so we can all understand the following claims I'm about to present. I don't know if you are aware of this issue on a daily basis, but usually when I teach the subject of genocide at the Open University, I'm surprised how much people are unaware of almost all other cases of genocide that occurred in various communities during the last few hundred years, let alone the last, last 50 to 60 years. Our awareness, especially in Israel, is usually steeped in the consciousness of the Holocaust, but is almost non-existent when it comes to other cases of genocide that occurred to non-Jews. This is a very problematic issue related to the way the Israeli education system decided to allocate resources for the many years of our schooling, which should teach us to be aware only of the Holocaust of European Jewry. In fact, the education system gave up in advance any attempt to teach boys and girls about other cases of genocide for its own reasons. And right now, I will not go into the analysis of these reasons. I want to point out something slightly different. The existing data on the number of Holocaust survivors in Israel, currently in 2014, is slightly problematic. Nevertheless, based on the number of recipients of benefits or even figures from organizations providing emotional support for survivors, one can get an idea of how many survivors are still with us. What's clear is that among survivors still alive today, the vast majority were little kids during World War II. Most of those who, who had reached adulthood ages 21 and over are no longer with us. Most of them passed away. The conclusion is quite clear, though we wish longevity to all survivors who are still alive and functioning among us, within a short amount of, amount of time, I'm not sure if it will be 10 or 20 years, there will be no more Holocaust survivors living among us. On the other hand, it might be less saddening to know that the number of Nazi war criminals who took part, part in the Holocaust 
during World War II is much smaller than that, since it's clear that little German kids did not take part in the war and all the living Nazi war criminals are in their 90s, if not older. Their numbers are rather small, of course, and within 5-10 years at most, there will be no more Nazi war criminals alive in the world. Why is this point important? As long as Holocaust survivors who can provide evidence of what happened to them are alive, on the one hand, while Nazi war criminals are still alive, be it those in jail paying for their crimes, those fair facing warrants for extradition, or the occasional Nazi war criminal caught and standing trial, as we occasionally, occasionally read in the newspapers or seen on TV, on the other hand, the Holocaust will not become an entirely historical or even mythical event. It is still alive in this regard. Once there will be no more living Holocaust survivors and Nazi war criminals left, and I'm sorry for including them in the same group, the Holocaust will become an entirely historical and even mythical event in terms of cognitive perception. This is what I mean when I use the word legendary. The conclusion is very simple. Life will be much easier for Holocaust deniers the moment there will be no more living Nazi war criminals and Holocaust survivors. Even today, if you do a brief online search for websites of Holocaust deniers, you'll be amazed at the amount of toxic and even rhetoric posted, posted by all kinds of delusional websites operators claiming that it's impossible so many people were exterminated in Auschwitz, stating the camp's small side, size as proof. How can this be? Some websites claim that the Germans, the most refined and enlightened nation in Europe, could not have committed such an awful act of murdering 6 million Jews. Some websites attempt to scientifically disprove the fact that 6 million Jews died in the Holocaust. And the list goes on and on. The voices of these terrible people only increase as the years pass. Unfortunately, I can assure you that the moment there are no more living Nazi war criminals or survivors, the voices of these Holocaust deniers will only get louder and it will be much more difficult to cope with them than it is today. The solution offered by the other camp of Holocaust and genocide scholars, counter to the, to the first view I presented that the Holocaust is a unique event that should not be compared to other cases of genocide, is slightly different. Our argument, and I include myself in there, even that of the other professors and lecturers teaching this important course, including Professor Yair Oron, the spiritual leader of this course, who, whom you'll meet next week in an interview we'll hold with him, believe that one mustn't ignore cases of genocide that happen to other peoples, especially if they are Jews, who care deeply about preserving the memory of the Holocaust of European Jewry. We believe that as people who carry the historical memory of the ultimate Holocaust genocide, it is our duty to do all we can to help other nations who were victims of genocide to preserve the historic memory of their specific case of genocide as part of the overall war against genocide and its dangers around the world. Besides that, practically speaking, we believe the best way to fight Holocaust denial, both now and in the future, not one or five years down the road, but one or two hundred years, when we'll all be long gone, though we still want humanity to remember the Holocaust in two hundred years. Therefore, we believe that the only way to preserve the memory of the Holocaust over time is to actually teach the Holocaust along with other cases of genocide that occur to other peoples at different periods in history. Not as a competition, we are not competing over who suffered more. We believe the suffering of a little Rwandan boy of the Tutsi tribe whose entire family was wiped out in 1994 is no smaller or greater than the suffering of a Jewish girl who survived the Holocaust and whose entire family was wiped out in Auschwitz or some other extermination camp. We examine this issue from a universal perspective, that of love for mankind, which doesn't believe any particular people can claim ownership of it. We consider this issue one that all of us, as human beings, must fight eradicate and do everything in our power to prevent from recurring. 
I wish us all an interesting course during the next five weeks. We have a course website you are invited to be active on. You are welcome to visit it right now and take part in discussions forums. We'll see you here at the next lecture this week. Goodbye for now. See you later. <music>